What's up? This is Dizzy Jenkins, and this is a closer look into my new album, Skeleton Key. My new album is called Skeleton Key. It's my third album. I would describe it as, first of all, a four-track EP, a soulful, stripped-down, acoustic, bluegrass, blues, and country-inspired. Is it something my listeners would have expected? Absolutely not. No, it was not something that they expected. It wasn't even something that I expected to do. It is a project that kind of came about seemingly out of nowhere, and I think that's what's so dope about it. Let me back it up. Some people met me doing hip-hop music, and so naturally they thought Dizzy Jenkins is a rapper or MC. A lot of people have referred me as such. I don't mind, you know. But then there's folks who met me playing bomba, so they're like, oh, you're a bombera, you're a drummer, and they'll describe me as such to people they talk about. And then I have this other group of people who have met me uh, doing heavy metal shows. So then when I started going back into making hip hop, those people were like, wait. So I've always been messing everybody up <laughs> all, all these years. The, the songs on the album, there's four songs. Three of those songs I already had from a long time ago. I'm talking like five or six years ago, maybe even longer. And I just never really had a place to put them. You know, they were just songs that I had. And it wasn't until recently, um, probably a couple of months ago, when I wrote You Decide, or it wrote me, it came to me, <laughs> that I thought, oh, I have like something. This is like, it started making me think about how I could put them together in a project. And that's where Skeleton Key came from. It wasn't something I had planned. It was very inexplicable without method like a lot of my stuff tends to be. So I didn't have this sort of grand plan, this scheme, like I'm gonna make the most random, unwanted nobody asked for this album ever like no nah, i didn't have no plan for that at all so that's kind of how that happened i just thought oh this song fits the vibe of these other three songs that i've had for a long time now i could finally do something with these other songs but it doesn't mean that they just kind of came out of nowhere i've had them forever but who worked with me on the album and how did it come to be uh well obviously you know i wrote and composed the songs but my homie todd who i'm in a metal band with Todd and I have known each other for a really long time, and he's my go-to guy for all things guitar, because I don't play guitar. <laughs> so I was like, I know who I can call for this cockamamie ass idea. My boy Todd, and he's always down to do all of the musical things with me. Um, and so I had told him a while back when I wrote What Tomorrow Brings, I was like, hey, I can't play, but I can give you the framework for what I want this song to um, sound like. So I sent him the reference track of me just singing the song, and I was like, and I want you to do on guitars, because <laughs> like, you know, I didn't have anything else. I was like, yeah, just do this. Like make it sound real simple. I told him strip it down, because Todd is a very technical guitarist. We play really technical heavy metal, and when by that, it's just like a lot of just chord progressions. He's got some kind of beast of a guitar with like more strings than it needs. <laughs> So I said, yo, just think about, you know, really strip down music, take it back to the old school, basically. You know, when you hear music by like Johnny Cash, how it's not complicated at all, but it had, it resonates with a lot of people. I was like, th put yourself in that kind of mindset when you're, you know, helping me piece this together. So with me kind of fumbling what I wanted into the mic and giving him the, the, the um, melody of the lyrics, that's where we put this whole thing together. For the next songs, obviously the same thing. I was like, Todd, yo. I need you, bruh. And he's all, you know, he was super down for the count and came through. And it worked very similarly to that other song where I was like, okay, here's the song, here's the melody, here's the lyrics, here's a reference track of me just recording it in my phone. Here's what I want you to do with it. On the song You Decide, he had a lot more freedom around that one than what I gave him on the other ones. On the intro, I took it up a notch and I actually played what I wanted him to do on the keyboard. Because I thought, yo, I know how to play piano. Why am I doing -da 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 in, a, in a phone? That's hella stupid. So um, I took my keyboard and I played the notes that I wanted him to play on guitar. But what he does is he not only took what I gave him, the notes, and played it on guitar, he added these little elements with different kinds of guitars that gave it the tones and the sounds that it has on the intro. I wouldn't have been able to do that on just the keyboard, you know? So he really added that little bit of magic to it. So it was really just me and him for all of the songs. But I had worked with uh, somebody named Reto Peter. He runs this studio, I think it's called the Tea House Studio. I met him through the homie Rico Pavon. Rico's this really dope poet MC that I know from the Puerto Rican community. 
and Rico had asked me to be on somebody's track named Brian Dyer. I feel bad, I didn't really know who Brian Dyer was, bro, but apparently he's lit. He has like mad credentials, yo. So I said, well, if Rico is um, asking me to be on this, I trust him. He works with really good people. He works with quality folks. Yeah, I'll get on the track. I heard it. I put down 16 bars for it, and I went to the studio to record it with Brian and with Reto. There's where Reto Peter meets me being an MC, right? So that's really funny because I, I worked with him. I think I got it in like one or two takes. I hope I impressed him with that, you know? And he asked me to send him some of my music, so I did. And then for this project, I, I reached out to him. I was like, hey, I have something that I want to do. It's really different from what you heard me do when I first pulled up to your studio, so I just want you to be kind of ready for that. And that's where we went from there. I recorded at his studio. He mixed it and mastered it, which uh, for all the audio junkies that I know, sounds good. Mm. <laughs> worth every penny right so that's basically how the project came together but um you know on guitars my homie Todd really really came through with his talent um on the other songs I played all the percussion on the intro I had played uh, my barril so for all the people who know me from bomba that was my drum that I had in the studio and I was actually playing that drum I played my maraca um, I played keys on you decide uh, so yeah, I'm real proud of that because it was like produced and written and composed and everything by me. It's like first time I was really playing my instruments. So I'm real proud of it because, um, you know, a lot of the times what happens is, you know, when I think people meet me in certain musical circles, they don't realize that I, I, I dip and I dabble into all these different styles, you know, and um, I appreciate Todd always being real open minded with me. He's just like, what do you got? Let's do it you know, always down. And then with Reto, you know, he's just really professional, really, really um, talented at what he does and also very open-minded because he met me doing one real particular thing and then I came to him with a completely different thing and was like, let's do it. And it all came together in a matter of like a couple of weeks. That was the other thing as it happened like lightning fast. We came to the studio ready to go. We had the songs ready to go. We uh, did it in four hours. I went back for another two hour session to add more vocals and we were it was a wrap. So it was like a really quick thing that came together so beautifully and I, I don't know, I'm just real proud of it. The intro is so funny because the intro um, wasn't supposed to really happen. I just thought three songs on an EP is really small, you know, and I just wanted to add a little something extra. And for anyone who's been following me for a really long time, y'all know, album number one had like too many songs. It was like 16 fucking songs. Album number two, I condensed it down a little bit and even then that was too much, right? And so now I'm getting to the point where I feel comfortable having just the right number of songs that make sense together, like a project. Like that started to mean more to me. But the intro itself, as I was um, finishing up the other songs, the vocals for that and that little line where I'm just saying the, the, the Lord is crying by the wayside I had mumbled that to myself a really long time ago I want to say like almost eight years ago that that line and that little melody has been around for the longest time just waiting for a home just waiting for some place to go you know and I thought that between the melody of that and between what I was saying the Lord is crying by the wayside he ain't got no one by his side and I say lonely I was like, this really matches with the vibe of this album. Like, just the tone and the message and the feeling that I was trying to convey, the melancholy feeling in a way, because it's like a happy, sad album. <laughs> and I thought it would be really dope to have an intro where I'm humming and starting out and kind of setting that tone, you know? And that's where I thought the barril would be a really good addition to the intro because it's almost introducing y'all to this thing and suddenly it's got like this deep, rooted nature as soon as you put the drum in anything it's going to change the tone it's going to change the vibe and it's going to add a little bit of magic to it and i purposefully did not have any other lyrics or, or a hook or anything like that so i was like this is perfect it's going to live here because it's short it's to the point it's melodic right and it's fitting the vibe of this entire project without forcing itself in there you know so that's kind of how the intro came about and that's the one where I had sent Todd just some keys and I was like on my little keyboard, which has a full circle story in its own right. The keyboard that I played, that I sent him the notes on, is the keyboard I rescued from my mom's house in New York when she was moving. So it was my childhood keyboard. It's like an old Yamaha. I think it was like my first or second musical instrument I ever got in my life. And I brought it back to California. And that's what I played on for the album. <laughs> so 
a little a little story behind the intro. It's so funny because I love the intro. Like I could hear it over and over again. And I I, I think even you said I need more. It's too short. Where's the rest of it? <laughs> so maybe it'll turn into a full song one day. Maybe not. Maybe I'll leave it right where it is. So I wish I had a title now because you know it feels almost unfair to just call it an intro. You know, um, but as far as the the words are concerned, I think I have a real interesting relationship with spirituality and what God is supposed to be. And you always hear we're made in his image. Right. And I thought, well, if I'm made in his image and I know I get sad and lonely and things happen to me where I'm not OK about, then is that the same for my God? Right. Like, are we reflecting each other? Right. So the Lord's been crying by the wayside. He ain't got no one by his side is just like a, in my own sort of take on where we are now with everything. We're all over the place with ourselves energetically. You know, it's almost like the Internet is our God right now. This is all like, where is the God that we know? Where are the gods we've known? Our ancestral gods, you know, things like that. Where are we? If we're God and we're in his image, where the fuck am I at? You feel me? So it was kind of like a whole slew of, of um, messaging into one little line that really just boils down to I need somebody I need somebody else to see me you know and then that song you decide where it's like some days I'm aching to be seen it's just a means to like try and understand what we don't understand so what tomorrow brings is funny because I would say that one is the most uh, sound wise uh, the most country sounding one so if anyone out there has ever heard of uh, th that Soggy Bottom Boy song, um, A Man of Constant Sorrow, that's where I would say the sound is most similar to. I wrote that song after a back injury, uh, which a lot of my folks remember my back injury. And so when I say the lyrics, I've been carrying my sorrows. I've been, I've been sitting in my sorrows, oh, my aching back. It was literal. I meant that shit. Like, I meant it, like, word for word. Um, and I say things like, I've been hearing about these angels, but don't know where they're at. You know, and it was kind of like this feeling of, like, damn, when you go through something really tough, you know you have people around you and you know that there's support, but you don't always feel it. And so this was one of those times where it was, like, a really painful, physically painful time for me. And I almost felt like, damn, there's nobody who gets what this is like from a sound perspective. I think that it was one of those uh, songs that is really simple in its melody. It's not complicated in its melody. It goes up and down, you know? It doesn't have a hook. It has like three verses that sound exactly the same. And so really from a, um, a technical standpoint, there's really nothing impressive about this song. Somebody's gonna hear it and probably not even think much of it, but when you, I think, listen to the lyrics and when you make comparisons, Maybe not comparisons, but if you're familiar with, um, I would say that style of music more, you know, folks who are familiar with country music, and they've told me that this has that very, somebody somebody said it was Appalachian folk kind of inspired sound, and that it really resonated with them because that's the kind of style that their dad listened to growing up, and I was like, damn, that's dope that I was able to tap into something from somebody who doesn't know me at all like that you know, and it made them go somewhere from their youth. Like, that's what the power of music really is all about, you feel me? And of course, on that one is where I was like, Todd, guitars, simple, real, real simple. Like, this is not supposed to be complicated. When you hear songs that are like super complex, I love that stuff, but I was like, we have to strip this down to its bare minimum. And I think that's what's gonna be the most impactful about it is that it's stripped down to the bare minimum. What I added at the last minute was the maraca. So there was that break in between where at first when we were kind of putting the song together, I didn't have an actual sound in the little break. It was just a pause and then it would go right into me and, and the guitar. So I thought at the last minute it would be dope to add like a maraca just to make it sound like we're in a desert, there's a rattlesnake kind of vibe effect to it. And it fills in the gap a little bit with some sound, you know, so that it wouldn't just kind of drag out. I feel like despite that not being a highly technical song, or that impressive as far as the lyrics are concerned or even the fact that its structure is lacking because it doesn't have a hook or a bridge or anything like that that you would typically find in a song. I love singing that song. I love performing it. I loved recording it. And it's one of my favorite ones on the, on the album. I know it's only four joints and I'm gonna say they're all my favorite, but that one's like up there. What inspired you decide? That was a day. Um, you know, we all go through our ups and downs. 
in life. It's only fair, it's only right. We human beings, we're complicated people. Um, I was having a day. I was incredibly overwhelmed. I was not okay. I decided to take a shower, like try to get feel better and cry it out. You know, just cry it out. And as that was happening, and I'm like, oh my God, everything sucks, right? Some days I feel so overwhelmed. Like I just started singing it. And I was like, crap, I gotta get out of the shower <laughs> and write this down. <laughs> so like my whole mood immediately just like, boom. It, it just came, it just came to me. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to write a song in that moment. I was trying to just let it out. I was just trying to cry and like have a moment with myself to, you know, try and calm down before my work day started. Cause that's, you know, we've been in quarantine for how long? You feel me? Like we've been dealing with things that everybody's referred to as unprecedented times, you know, as a, as a mom, as an employee of some place, as a wife, as a family member, as a friend, you know? I feel like emotionally and spiritually, I've been through the ringer in the past year, trying to hold it all together. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, I got to hold it together for my kid, for myself, for everybody around me that's dependent on me. And there are moments, or there were moments especially, where it all seemed like it was too much and I couldn't step away from any of it. Like, I can't be like, gonna hang up my mom hat real fast so I could go. It don't work like that. And I'm fortunate to be working because there's people who have lost their jobs and have lost their livelihoods during this time. But I feel like a lot of the people who kept working were now overwhelmed with work, <laughs> trying to make up for where other people weren't. And so it was just like a round the clock thing. And me working technically in the tech space, but for the home care industry, that industry was turned on its ass during COVID. It was like every day I had to deal with somebody getting sick, a client died. You know, these people got exposed to COVID and like thrown into the fray of something that I just was thoroughly unprepared for, which a lot of people can probably relate to. And, you know, a whole year later, after trying to hold it together, after trying to act strong and be strong and get up and face every single day, despite being in a fucking pandemic, despite my baby having a distance learn, despite the world falling apart around us, you dig? It was just a lot. And I, as a human being, needed to honor that need to just cry that shit the fuck out of my system. Little did I know that a whole ass song was gonna come out of it, but I guess that's the blessing of being a creative individual at the same time, is like you never know where inspiration is gonna come from. Literally, like right after that, sh got out the shower, was like, <gasps> some days I feel so well, right? Some days I'm barely out of bed. I just said the honest to God truth about what goes on with me. Some days I'm barely out of bed. Some days I'm all up in my head. Some days I'm floating above the clouds and everything's great. And in the bridge where I said, funny how it's so inconsistent, you never know what the day will bring. All I know is I do my best and none of us are okay, it seems, right? Like those are the lyrics to that. The reason why it's called You Decide is because, you know, I said, well, if I, I literally said to myself, like, if I wrote this song today, then what kind of day is today? I get to decide what kind of day today is. You feel me? Like, ultimately these are my circumstances, but I still have control over the outcome of a lot of things, you know, and I need to almost force myself to look at that positive side while still honoring the side of me that needs some um, support and needs love and needs care, you know. So I really hope with that one that people could really relate to that shit because <laughs> I was trying to write for everybody. And I was like, I'm not alone. I know if this is how I feel, that somebody out there feels the same way too. All right, Land of the Have Nots, how that came about, the, the title the song the message everything else that's a song i've had in my back pocket for a long time i'm talking about before like we moved into this house and you've known me a long time so that was a long time ago this is like seven or eight years by now remember earlier i said i've had some of these joints for like a re like forever it's just where do you where am i supposed to put them land of the have nots i wrote that song while i was on the 72 bus going up san pablo one night is when I lived in the border, like Emeryville, where the San Pablo, where that 7-Eleven is at. I used to live like a little bit past there on Adeline. But I was coming from West Oakland on the bus one night. And I just looked around and everybody was just looking kind of like, damn, we're on this bus and everybody is, is struggling through something. The people around me were very much not, on the surface, okay. When I said in the land of the have-nots, people go by staring at each other with empty eyes because you know you make eye contact with was back before there was masks right and you could actually see somebody's whole face you know you make eye contact with them and they just kind of make this eye contact back and there's like a glaze over it's like nothing there people are exhausted you know it's like riding a bus in west oakland and it's just a lot for some people it's a lot for everybody living in the hood is hard you know it just is that's where i'm 
my whole life I lived in the projects in New York and so this was very much reminiscent of that time of going running around seeing things that you know is too much for a kid specifically when I said all we know is struggle and lies and things like that um, all we do is seek each other asking why it's because that's what we do right like when we talk about our problems in the neighborhood we're looking to each other to really like try to build solutions or be there for each other as a support system because nobody's gonna understand what that's like right you can't talk to somebody who's from a privileged area, a, a affluent area, about life in the projects, about life in the hood. They don't understand that. They're never going to understand that. I can only speak on these things with people who understand where I'm from. And it don't have to be that you from Oakland and I'm from Oakland. It has to be that we from a hood, we from the hood. And so that's partially what inspired that line. It's just like you make this eye contact with somebody and they know you'll struggle right by looking at you and you know they struggle right by looking at them. It's just this instant connection that you can make. And things like that really will only happen on public transportation because when you in your car, you in your own little world, if you think about it, you know, but you're sharing a space with other people when you're on something like the 72 bus going up San Pablo. But I specifically remembered um, seeing a girl work in the corner. And that is obviously not something new to the area. You know what I'm saying? That's not something new to people. I happen to have a sister who has struggled with addiction and has done those things as well. And I know what it's like to have to pray for her and to have to go find her and to have to like be there for her in ways that other people, they're not going to understand. So I don't see somebody who's in the street and think, oh my God, look at them. Like they should get their life together. I think what happened to get you there? You know what I'm saying? There's always a circumstance to get somebody to where they're at. And that's what we fail to remember as people is because maybe my life right now might be lit, right? And so, you know, you might look at somebody and be like, well, I don't, they should pick themselves up by the bootstraps like a lot of folks will, will have that mentality. But what they're not considering is that there's all kinds of circumstances that may have led to that person being in the position that they're in. Nobody like wants to be in the street. Nobody wants to be poor. Nobody wants to have to work a corner. Nobody wants to be an addict, you know? And so I just thought to myself, well, this is somebody's daughter and somebody's sister. Might be somebody's mama, might be somebody's granddaughter, just like my sister is. You know, so when I said, you know, mama pray to Jesus for her little light, standing on San Pablo well into the night, walking around in circles, waiting for the light of day. It's like a cry, you feel me? Because it was so fucking personal. It was like, I saw that girl and I saw my sister. I didn't see a stranger. I didn't see a stranger when I made eye contact with those people on the bus. I saw people that could have easily been family, friends, loved ones of any sort. Specifically the part about truth is our gold, I said. In the land of the have-nots, truth is our gold. Because you know my history books ain't got the same stories my daddy told. So the reason why I said that is because I was really thinking about like, I know in our communities and in black communities and a lot of Latin communities, a lot of our history is through storytelling. And so these are the things that I would probably talk about to my kid in the future and be like, yo, this is what I experienced as a youth or as a person living in this area or that area. You know what I'm saying? And you're not going to find that in history books, right? You're going to find a lot of like Eurocentric kind of white history in history books, right? But what about the struggles we've actually been through? We're still scratching the surface of the things that we've experienced as people of color. And it's so painful. You feel me? But we need that truth. That's the goal. Truth is the goal. That's the riches of life right there is knowledge and truth. So it was, it was such a sad kind of song and a sad way to end the album, but... That entire song came to me right there, like on that bus ride going up San Pablo that night. You know, you you take a bus out here in these streets, bro, you see some things, you know, and it changes your perspective being the type of person who is actually out there, like, you know, experiencing it. Even if you haven't experienced it for yourself, even if you don't have a family member who's been an addict or who's been in the street, even if you yourself haven't been in those positions, it is important to know these stories because you are gonna move around in the world a little bit differently. You'll have more empathy. You will look at things beneath the surface instead of what's just in front of you. And I hope that people, when they listen to that song, that it prompts them to think a little bit more about circumstances and how people get to where they are in their life. It ain't just about what you see on the surface. It's a whole process, it's a whole series of events that get somebody to where they are, whether it's a good place or a bad place. That's kind of where that song came from. It's funny because, you know, it wasn't my intention to turn it into that kind of vibe either. Like, you know what I'm saying? I wasn't out looking for a way to make people think and sad and 
<laughs> or even myself you feel me like it was just these songs now have a home finally like that's how i felt with this whole thing it was like finally these there's a place for these sounds to be because i couldn't put it on algorithm and blues what the fuck was i supposed to do put a country ass song on algorithm and blues no that's that project it has it had its own message its own tone its own vibe the bomba songs have their place their own tone their own vibe the metal songs all that stuff they're all like in their own little compartments right these songs were just kind of flailing about like do something i don't know what to do with them and it just felt like the right time to do it i have been calling myself a multi-genre singer songwriter for a while now because i feel like that's the most all-encompassing label that i can give to myself because if you say if you say dizzy jenkins is an mc now i'm here and i'm stuck and i can't get out you call me, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in a metal band. I'm here and now I can't get out, right? Uh, Bombera, I'm there and I can't get out. So it was like multi-genre. I'm writing every fucking thing that I feel like writing because I listen to a lot of different kinds of music. And a skeleton key is a key that can open many doors. So it felt like an appropriate title for the project. The album cover was a process. It was so organic though. I didn't have to do much to guide her on what to do. She just did that all on her own. First of all, a, a little thing about Caitlin Madison is that she's a really phenomenal, talented illustrator. I met her a few years back when I did a little, somewhat acoustic kind of quiet set at this store called Fleetwood in San Francisco. And it was for a zine release um, for a zine called uh, Sea Witches. So, you know, I met those girls through the surf community and was able to connect with them. And I always thought, yo, me, I'm going to work with you in some capacity someday. I don't know how or when. You know how it is where, you know, you put somebody in your back pocket like, I'm going to work with you one day. When the album came together, she was the first person I thought of for the album cover. I was like, now's our time, honey. And I reached out to her. She was really excited to do it. I sent her a mood board of just sort of these lithography etching wood carving style artworks. I love tattoos and American traditional tattoos are some of my favorite. I have a lot of them and I told her the font. I wanted the font in that style, American traditional tattoo style font. And a couple of just inspiration pictures here and there. And I said, listen to it first. Just listen to the songs and then you come up with whatever your heart desires from there and I'm sure it'll be lit. And she did that. I was like, so when I saw the first sketch, I was blown away because I wasn't expecting all of that. I was like, yo, she just pulled together the most beautiful. She, she found a photo of me sitting in the peacock chair, the, <laughs> the Black Panther chair, um, and then took inspiration from that photo and all of the imagery and the lyrics and then made the album cover from that. The only thing I had asked her to change, because it was a rough sketch, we, we talked together about what else I would want to incorporate into it. I loved the element of like one side and one side. So if you look closely at it, it's like one side's got these little angels, these other side got these little pitchforky little devils and shit. It's like a laugh now, cry later kind of almost theme to it. And it's funny because I have a tattoo like that. I have a uh, pirate ship tattoo on one leg with the thunderstorm and another one with the sun. And fun fact, it has the lyrics to La Bamba in the banners. One says, yo no soy marinero, the other one says, soy capitan. <laughs> so she basically took all of that and, and ran with it. I just said, girl, we need my hair bigger. I was like, my hair's big. I know it doesn't look like it under this, but I said, I need my hair to be bigger. And I asked her, at first she had an eight point sun uh, up at the top. And I said, can we make that a Taino sun? I was like, first I need people to know I'm Puerto Rican, because in case you didn't already know, Dizzy Jenkins is Afro Boricua. I said it would be dope to have a, a Taino sun up there, you know, just sort of this indicator, the 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 bat signal to all the other Boricuas. <laughs> this bitch is Puerto Rican because you can't put that on there if you're not, right? So she changed it to that, and it was just so lit. And I specifically asked her to give the angels afros because at first they had kind of like sort of like just long hair. I said, girl, them angels need my hair too. <laughs> I was like, I just if you don't do anything else, the angels need some afros. They need natural hair, honey. So that was like about it. And of course, the raw illustration that I got first, the drawing, I was wearing like a skirt in the picture. And I was like, look, I know I'm asking you for a lot right now, but can you draw me some Tims? <laughs> I said, look, D Dizzy Jenkins' album is, is a sound you ain't never heard before. But honey, I'm still wearing Tim's and I'm still Boricua, so like we need to capture that so people know who the fuck I is in the in the album cover. And she drew me some Tim's. I was like, yo, she's so talented. So that's where the album cover came from. I decided to leave it in black and white because I like the look of it. 
although at some point we may turn it into color and I would like to actually have like vinyl records made of it because it's just such a beautiful cover but if you look really closely at it there's a lot of detail in the cover it's hard to see when you're just looking at a small little Instagram post but it's fire I lo and I love her she's a really wonderful person and incredibly talented so make sure you follow her too my closing statements on Skeleton Key are uh, <laughs> one that album was born and raised right here in East Oakland that's number one. Skeleton Key was was created here in the town. To go into it with an open mind, to never limit yourself or any other artist, because that tends to happen quite a bit, and to try to think about music from the perspective of history too. When you think about country music, rock music, you know, blues, that's black music. It has roots in black music. And that's one of the things where I felt really proud of was like, well, I'm reclaiming some of this stuff in my own way. I may never do an album like this ever again. It was just something that I decided to do because I'm tapped into every facet of myself as a creative, as a creator. And I never want to put limitations on myself creatively because that's putting limitations on myself spiritually. And I'm trying to evolve every day as a person, as a musician, as a human. So give it a shot, give it a chance. Um, I know it's not for everybody, but just show your girl some love shit. <laughs> I do need to give a big fat shout out to Todd Burnham on guitars. That's the homie right there. I'm really excited for what we're going to do in the future. So everybody need to stay tuned for that. Um, need to give a shout out to Reto for the mixing, mastering, and for kind of taking me in to your creative recording space and letting me do something a little bit different. I'm always wanting to shout out my husband and my kid because they're the most supportive people in my life and are just like, yeah, you want to do it? Okay. I'm sure it's going to be great. <laughs> Um, I want to give a shout out to Caitlin Madison who did the album cover, that lit album cover, bro. Oh my God, she really like did that, and I, I'm in love with the album cover. Um, my homegirl Chelsea for the promo shots, my homegirl Alicia for the styling of the promo shots, and for everybody who's allowed me to just uh, spread my little creative wings and to Versol, of course, for having me here today and um, for the long dope phone call we had after you heard it. You were like, I need to talk to you. <laughs> so we had this whole conversation to the phone too so yeah so and shout out to me <laughs> you can find me easily same number same hood for those of you who know me very well <laughs> same number same hood dizzy jenkins on all platforms everywhere the album was first dropped to Bandcamp. I really like Bandcamp as a platform, so I dropped it there first, but it is now on Spotify and YouTube and all the other places. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Go listen to the album and don't forget, be excellent to each other. <laughs>